chapter 1. Thinking about what to do after I get through Romans on Sunday mornings, so uh, we, might, uh, we might have a few messages just that fill in the, the blanks until we start a new series. I like preaching series. I like preaching uh, through a book of the Bible especially. Thinking about maybe on Sunday nights, possibly Wednesday nights, thinking about preaching a, a series on masculinity. Uh, I, th- I think in America, and I guess worldwide, uh, it seems like, I'm not, and I'm not talking about just being a macho man who knows how to punch with his fists or swing across the, the uh, jungle in a grape, with a grapevine or anything like that. I'm talking about being a man who, who takes responsibility, acts like a man, looks like a man, and uh, does the duties of a man. I'm thinking about doing a series on that, and I don't know how else we might change the world. I, I, I know we've got to win people to the Lord, and we also have to teach and preach those things. So I'm thinking about doing masculinity. If you've got some ideas on a series you'd like to hear, uh, you can write it on the note card and give it to me, and I'll, uh, I'll certainly consider it and pray about it. I probably won't do it, but at least it'll make you feel good. <laughs> Is my, fla- my face glowing red? Anybody tell? Is it? I'm just going to tell you, I, I can feel it kind of tingling. I take, uh, once a day, I take uh, niacin. The doctors tried to put me on, uh, years ago, put me on the, uh, what are those drugs that lower your cholesterol? Statin drugs. They've tried to put me on statin drugs. I'm kind of allergic to those and, and just don't like to take them. I don't like the way they make me feel. And so niacin is supposed to have cholesterol-lowering ability and so it's a natural supplement so I take niacin once a day and usually when I take it I take it in the morning most of the time and after I take it in about 30 minutes or so I'll feel myself glowing like Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer and so I can feel it tingling in my face and I look in the mirror and sure enough I'm red as a beet and uh, today I didn't take my niacin before church this morning and so I took it this afternoon and I just now feel it kicking in so I just want to know you're not embarrassing me at all (coughs) I may embarrass you. We'll be in 2 Corinthians and chapter number 1. We'll read beginning in verse number 3 and we'll read down probably to verse 8. Verse number 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, And the God of all comfort. That's going to be our subject tonight. The comfort of God. Verse 4 says, Who comforteth us, God, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abound by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings, which we also suffer. And whether or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, in so much that we despaired even of life. Sound like Paul had endured some tribulations and trials, sufferings and fears, doesn't it? And you do too. And I do. We're human beings. And just because we got saved doesn't mean we're not going to have trouble anymore. And when we have trouble, when we have trials and tribulations, things come into our lives to challenge us, then it's easy to become depressed, despondent, pressed out of measure, as Paul says in these verses. And sometimes we, we want to give up in the fight. And although we may not give up, sometimes we give out. And sometimes we get tired Sometimes we become weary 
And uh, we just, we're not at the top of our game. We're just not doing our service to Christ like we could if we were comforted. And tonight I want to bring the message entitled, The God of All Comfort. And so in 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 8, we see God showing us as Christians how we can have this comfort. We didn't pray, did we? Let's pray together. Father, we, we love you tonight and we thank you that when we go through tribulations and trials, we go through troubles and we all do, Lord, you know that. And Lord, you've promised here to give us comfort, comfort like only you can give. And Lord, I, I know that even in a small crowd like this, there must be several people who have troubles of some sort even now. And Lord, these things can be a distraction to our joy, a distraction from our family, a distraction from our ability to serve in church, our distraction from just living as a Christian should live. And so, Lord, we pray tonight you'd show us how to have that comfort that you offer us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, the inspired, infallible scriptures written by the pen of Paul says that God is the God of comfort. You believe that? That's what the scripture says there, isn't it? He's the God of all comfort. He is the God of all comfort. And there are plenty of times when Christians find themselves in tribulations and trials, things that are just not going well. And at that time, comfort becomes very valuable to the soul. Wouldn't you agree with that? We need comfort. I mean, even the manliest of the manly, even the most macho of the macho, they need comfort at times. Everybody has a breaking point. Everybody has a bending point. And everybody needs comfort from some type or I should say from God. There's no other comfort that measures up to the comfort of God. No one single person is able to maneuver through life without going through these times of trouble. It's just going to happen. And life is treacherous. And God has promised, he's promised to give us comfort. And one of these scriptures you'll remember in John 14 and verse number 15, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you. Abide means that he's going to stay put. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit of God comes in and he is that comforter. And when he moves in, when you get saved, friend, you're not going to lose it. You're not going to go without the Holy Spirit. You're never going to get any more of the Holy Spirit than you get when you get saved. But he can get more of you. And so as we see the promise of God that he's going to give us a comforter at the point of salvation... I'm afraid there's a lot of times when you and I need comfort and we don't call on him to help us. To read on, he says, I'll send you another comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. He's promised right there, as well in some other places, to give us a, a comfort when we need it. And there's times when we don't need it, but there are times when we do. The word comfort carries more meaning than just sympathy. You know, little Johnny falls down and scrapes his knee and mama pats him on the head and tells him it's going to be okay and he'll whimper a little while and get over it. And she gives him a little comfort. Well, we see our Christian brothers and sisters at times we're hurting over something more than a scraped knee and, and sometimes you know somebody can pat you on the head and tell you it's going to be all right or pat you on the back and say things are okay. That's sympathy. But the word comfort here carries more weight and meaning than just sympathy. It means sympathy for sure, but sympathy with strength, ability. When God gives you his comfort, he gives you something more than just, well, I know how you feel. God gives you some strength to get you through it. And that's what we need. When we get comforted, we want more than just 
<coughs> somebody <coughs> say, I know how you feel. And so it carries a, a lot of meaning. When uh, our girls were little, Angela and Lara were playing out in the, in the shop. My dad had a shop, woodworking shop, and we were over there visiting them. And the girls were, I don't know, they're four, three or four, three or four or five years old, maybe, maybe three or four. And they were in the shop playing. We didn't know where they were at. They got out there where all those power tools were. And, uh, and Angela's standing there beside the table saw. And uh, there's a motor on the side of the table saw with a pulley and a belt on it that drives the blade. Well, she was standing right beside of that. And Alara got over there and, and flipped the switch on. Well, when that switch flipped on, that pulley with the belt grabbed Angela's hair and ripped. It took a big spot, as big as the palm of my hand, out of her head. I mean, she was scalped. And you talk about having a, she sounded like she was on the warpath when she came in the house. Boy, she was weeping and wailing and gnashing with her teeth. And she was hurting. And we tried to comfort her, but you know what? There's just something that God can do that nobody else can do. And when we're hurting, maybe we've been hurt by uh, a romance. Maybe we've been hurt by some family member that's gone wayward. Maybe we've been hurt because of, of, a, of a friendship that's been broken. And while somebody can empathize with us and sympathize with us, there's no real strength there like the strength that God can give. And he can heal our hurts. My first grandpa to die lived over at Lundenberg, which was through the hills there, the old little country road about five miles away. And uh, this was probably in the late 50s, I think, maybe, maybe as late as 1960. And all of my, I knew all of my grandparents, and they were all close enough, you know, and we were really, really, uh, really close uh, in relationship. And they lived just five miles away, and we'd go see them pretty often. Well, my first grandpa, my first grandparent to die was my grandpa Mankin. And when he passed away, that was a new and unique experience for me. I, I think I was my, maybe nine years old, and I'd never lost a family member before. And it was, uh, it was really working on my emotions as we drove over there. They, they had wakes in those days. You know what a wake is. They'd, they'd usually put the, uh, bring the body home in the casket, and, and they put, put my grandpa in the in the. Uh, one of the bedrooms there, and and uh, there were people all in the living room, several people visiting, you know, and talking, and, and Grandpa's body and casket was in the bedroom. And so we went in, my, my mom and my dad and me, and I think my brother was along, and we went in, and we're standing there around all those people, and my grandma came over and, and looked down at me, and, and she was Christian. Her and Grandpa both were Christians, and, and Grandpa had gone on to heaven, and Grandma knew it, and, and they were very sweet Christians. And Grandma looked down at me, and she said, Ricky, would you like to go in and see Grandpa? Oh, well, I've never done this before. <laughs> I don't know. And uh, she said, come on, it'll be okay. And she walked me to the bedroom door where the casket was against the wall, and, and she walked me over there in front of the casket so I could see my Grandpa. And she saw me tearing up and probably, sh probably shaking a little, <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe trembling a little. And she looked down, saw the tears in my eyes, and she patted me. This is her husband that's laying there in the casket, my grandpa. But she saw the tears in my eyes. She reached down and patted me on the shoulder and hugged me up close to her. She's <clears throat> she said, now, Ricky, that's, that's not really grandpa anymore. That's just the body, the shell that he used to live in. He's in heaven now. And when she explained that to me, and the pat on the shoulder, she gave me some strength. Where'd she, where'd she get that strength? How could she do that? She got it from God. Because she was a Christian, the, the Lord of all comfort, the God of all comfort, he had already put his arm around Granny, and he'd already comforted her so she could usher me into that room, and she could become the middleman passing God's comfort through her to me. And that's the way it goes in this passage of Scripture. When you receive God's comfort, you, you can then become the middleman that can pass it on to somebody else. Well, the comfort of the Lord is sympathetic, but it's much more than that. It's strength too. The comfort of the Lord is strength. And let me, let me say three things about this tonight. Number one, the source of this comfort is God Himself. The source of this comfort 
is God. It's not something we drum, with, drum up within us. It's not something that we can invent. It's not something that we get out of a psychology book. It's not something we get out of a science book. It's not something we get out of a self-help book. This is the comfort of God. He is the source. If anybody comforts you, if they comfort you, they just got it from God and passed it on. And the source of this comfort that we're talking about tonight, this strengthening type of comfort, the kind that can get you through your troubles and your tribulations and your trials and your hurts. This is the kind of strength that comes from God, and He is the source. I, I want you to look again at verse number 3. It said, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. He's the God of comfort. And it says then in verse 4, Who comforteth us in all our tribulation. You know, it's incredible. What people will do when they're hurting, when people need comfort, they don't always, not all people turn to God for the source of their comfort. And it's amazing what people do. People, I mean, you can read about it and hear about it on the news shows. All Some people give their testimony, maybe not even Christians, but some people turn to food, <laughs> binge eating. Maybe, maybe they're cramming Twinkies in their mouth. You know, we don't want to get down on Twinkies too much because I, I thought oftentimes that one of these days they're going to find this preacher dead laying across the bed with a Twinkie in each hand, you know, passed out, overdosed on Twinkies. Man, I, I'd mentioned Twinkies once in a message, I guess. It's been a year or so ago, and Norm and Nancy Wood heard it, and uh, UPS came one day and brought me a case of Twinkies. I mean, there, there was a case of them. I thought, I'll never eat all of them. And so I'm okay with Twinkies, but I'm telling you, sometimes people turn to food. And they'll go on binge eating. Some people are bulimic. Some people are anorexic. And so people do all kinds of strange things. Some people are hurting, and they'll turn to philosophy. And they'll, they'll read about uh, the philosophers of the past, Aristotle and Plato, and see what they've got to say about things. And they'll read modern philosophers and and some people will turn, you know, people will turn to booze. Amen. People are hurting and they turn to booze. Let me just tell you, there's a liquor called Southern Comfort. And I'm here to tell you, it ain't really comfort. It's going to make you feel worse when you wake up tomorrow than it did when you drunk it the night before. And some people turn to drugs. My, oh my, how much drugs are using today. And it's not just street drugs. People abuse their prescriptions. And they take drugs because it brings a little bit of relief temporarily and lets them escape from the reality of the hurts they have. But then, you know how it goes, reality always comes back. You can't run from your troubles. You try to run from your troubles and they're going to chase you. And you can run all the way to the other next state over or you can run to the west coast or the east coast and those troubles will eventually catch up with you. They're going to go where you go. And drugs won't help it. It may give you a little bit of, of deception thinking you've helped things, but then when, <clears throat> when the drug habit gets worse, you're worse. People turn to illicit sex. I mean, there's, there's prostitutes and what the Bible calls uh, uh, whoremongers, and so they turn to something that brings tempor temporary pleasure and they don't know that they're, they're bringing on themselves more health issues and psychological issues and spiritual issues. And it doesn't help. It only deceives them for a short period of time. Some people get into witchcraft looking for something that will ease them a little bit. And so they call up the psychics out in California. Have you seen those uh, commercials on TV? Call up the California psychics. They, this is the best uh, psychic reading you've ever had or your money back. <laughs> well, the psychics don't know anything. I don't think they have anything but a good persuasive sales talk and tell you what you want to hear. Astrologers, same thing. It's, it's basically witchcraft, either by deception or devilish witchcraft straight out of hell. Tarot cards, palm readers, astrology, all sorts of devilish remedies that people try. Some people try science. Even today we hear that quite a bit on TV, don't we? Just follow the science. Well, Following science would probably be a good thing if 
if it was real science they were giving us. <laughs> Problem is, science and philosophy and political persuasion all intermingle and you don't know what's real science anymore. And so people try to use science, and that includes psychiatry and inappropriate medical treatment. I, I'm, I'm not against medical treatment. I'm not against chiropractors. I, I think those things can be a real help at times. But when they're inappropriate and not right for the situation, some people even turn to get freedom from their unhappiness, turn to things like exercise. Some people go crazy about exercise. Now, not me. I'm not going crazy over exercise. Here's, here's my philosophy. I, I think you're born with a certain number of beats in your heart, and I'm not going to waste my beats on exercising. But some people go crazy over exercise. I mean, they're just exercise, exercise, exercise. And it kind of provides an escape for them. And there's others that yoga is a big thing now. Now, besides yoga coming from uh, Eastern mysticism, now I'm not saying all yoga is mystical or some, some uh, mystical religion, but I am saying it came originally from there. And people get caught up in things like that and trying to get some relief from the boredom or from the hurt in their lives. When God is the one, is the God of all comfort. One scientist got it right. A man by the name of James Simpson. Anybody ever heard of him? Sir James Simpson. He, uh, this is from John Phillips' commentary on Psalm 117. <clears throat> and this, I quote, it says, A section in the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago is devoted to discoveries that have revolutionized modern medical science. Among those honored by a greater-than-life portrait is Sir James Simpson, who lived from 1811 to 1870, the man who discovered chloroform. You know what that is, chloroform. You know, you breathe it on a rag and it knock you out. Uh, he discovered chloroform, and before this discovery, even the simplest operation was a nightmare because they didn't have anything to knock you out with. I mean, they saw your leg off and you're, you're fully awake watching them. And, and uh, that doesn't go real well, especially with children. And so Simpson uh, not only put people to sleep through the worst horrors of their operations, but he opened the door to medical operations which were before impossible. Sir James Simpson was a Christian. And... Once he was interviewed by a newspaper man. And the newspaper man asked him, said, uh, Sir James, what, uh, what is your greatest, what would you say is your greatest discovery? And very quickly he said, my greatest discovery was when I discovered that I was a sinner before God. The newspaper said, no, no well, l let me ask you, what's your, what's your second greatest discovery then? He said, my second greatest discovery, that's easy. That's when I discovered Jesus died for sinners like me. <laughs> now, you see what I'm saying? Chloroform was a good invention. It was a good science. But this scientist who discovered chloroform, he recognized that God, the God of all comfort, is greater than chloroform or anything else that might give us temporary peace. Materialism. Some people look for escape from their hurts. Their heartaches, their tribulations, they look for help through materialism. Some people are very empty and they're looking for something to fill the void. And some people say, if I can just get a if if we can just get a bigger house, everything will be everything will be great and I'll be happy. I'll be comforted. Or if I can just get that new car, if I can get a new car that I really love, everything will be okay. Well it won't be, unless there's a sixty five T bird, now they do pretty good. But you you see all kinds of people trying to fill their lives with materialism. If I can just get more, if I can get that position with the big company, pays a lot of money. If I can just get enough money, everything else will work out. It doesn't go that way because a lot of rich people kill themselves. There are a lot of rich people who are unhappy. I'm not saying you can't have money and have happiness and joy and relief and comfort. I'm not saying you can't have them both, but it's rare. Those people who are the most comforted are generally people who will be satisfied with what they have. You see, a, you see a family that dad comes in from work and he walks into the little house that's not 
very new. And he walks in, and the kids run to meet him, and they're happy to see Daddy come home from work. And, and they sit down at the table, and they're laughing and talking, and they're having a good time. And they're talking about what happened that day, and they're sitting around the old table. They haven't got a dining room. Their table's in the kitchen, and they're sitting around the table, and the little boy tells Dad, and so said, Dad, at school today, I hit a home run. Oh, boy, that's great. And they talk about that, and they laugh. Little girl said, the dog got a hold of my dolly and chewed her hair off. The dog's name was Max. <laughs> and so they're sitting there talking, and they're eating supper. might not be a fancy supper, but it's a home where there's joy and love, and they're comforted together because they know the Lord. And then you imagine a whole different scenario. You've got a, you've got a mansion over here, and Dad drives up in his brand new uh, Lamborghini, and he gets out and he goes up to the door, and there's no kids to meet him. And when he does walk through the door, he's snarling, meets some teenagers that's snarling back at him, sarcastic. The wife doesn't even like him. And they sit down in a big dining room and they've got a big chandelier over a long table in this beautiful dining room, but they hardly notice each other and they eat their fancy food. I mean, they've got it all laid out and they eat their fancy food and dad's thinking about how he can make some more money at the company. And he hurries through his meal and gets heartburned and gets out the door so he can go and do something else that he wants to do. The kids are wanting to get away from the parents because they're not happy. The wife goes out and does her thing. They got plenty of money, but they don't have comfort. Which would I rather have? If I had to choose one of the two, I'd take the old house with the rustic table, pinto beans, and cornbread. Doesn't get any better eating than that anyway. Amen. God is a lover of your soul, and he's able to comfort you in a way that has strength to help. I always love the verse in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28 when Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's the God of all comfort. Let me show you the second thing. The second thing is the subject of this comfort, the subject of this comfort. Who gets it? Who gets this? We saw the source of it. The source is God himself. Doesn't matter if, it, if he channels it through people. The source is God. But who is the subject? Who gets the comfort? Notice in verse 4 he says, Who comforteth us in all our tribulation. Well, who gets the comfort? <laughs> Those who are in tribulation. Well, why is that? That doesn't seem fair. The reason the comfort goes to those in tribulation is because those who are not in tribulation don't need it. When everything's going hunky-dory and you're on the mountaintop, you're not looking for comfort. But when you're down as low as a snake's belly in a wagon rut and you're looking up and anyway, any direction you look is up, when you're in that kind of situation and everything's hurting and nothing seems good, you need comfort. God says, that's the people I'm looking for. That's the ones I want to give comfort to, those who are in tribulation. So what qualifies you for this comfort? Tribulation. Hey, that ought to make you feel better about your situation. If you're in a situation where there's some discomfort, where there's some hurt, where there's some, where there's some uh, trial and tribulation and testing, that's good news because that's who God's looking for. He said, I want to comfort you. He's the one who gets the comfort. Are you ever in tribulation? He's the one looking for you. If a person is not in trouble, he needs no comfort. Now you can look in the Bible, look through the Bible. You look hard in the Bible and see how many saints of God you can find. Find out how many saints of God that are well known in the Bible that didn't go through some trouble and trial and tribulation. You'll find very few that didn't go through some real hardships. Seems like that's the people God uses. And then when you get out of the Bible and just get into history, you'll find out that there were some very great people who themselves, just in the historical circle, that suffered as well. 
Remember a man by the name of Charles Spurgeon? Spurgeon had terrible bouts. He, he himself, by his own testimony, he said, I, I have had terrible fits of anxiety and depression. The great Charles Spurgeon, the one who could stand in the pulpit and speak to 7,000 people on Sunday morning, the one who said, the one that they said was the silver tongued orator, the one who wrote thousands of sermons over his lifetime, the one who saw thousands come to Christ through his preaching, the one who filled up the Metropolitan Tabernacle every Sunday with people to hear him speak. He said, boy, I go through some really bad fits of depression. Spurgeon. Well, what's he got to be depressed about? Everybody's got something they can be depressed about. Just because you got money, just because you got fame, just because you're successful doesn't mean you won't have depression, despondency. Martin Luther that led the Reformation had terrible bouts with despondency. You see, if those people can have it, those people need comfort, don't you figure you and me, we're going to need it sometime? Like often? If you're facing great troubles, God says, I've got comfort for you. Now, he doesn't say he's going to take you out of the problem. What was it that Paul said? I besought the Lord thrice for the thorn in the flesh. And God said, my grace is sufficient for thee. He didn't pull Paul out of that situation, but he gave him the grace to go through the situation. And God won't always pull you out of the fire, but he, like he did with the three Hebrew children, he'll get in the fire and walk with you. And that works pretty good. They came out all right. Let me show you the third and last thing. The stewardship of this comfort. We saw the source of it, the people who receive it, and now we're going to see the stewardship of it. In verse number four, he says, Who comforteth us? in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them. Notice that phrase, able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Here's the added benefit to the comfort of God. When I'm in trouble, when I'm going through tribulation, when I'm hurting, when I'm in pain, when I need somebody to give me some relief, God comes along and says, I'm going to help you out. I'm going to help you, Brother Brooks. I'm going to give you some help. I'm going to comfort you. And he applies some comfort. I begin to breathe and say, Boy, that feels a lot better, Lord. I'm glad you came along to help me out. And then he says, Now, Rick, I'm going to have you to remember what I've just done for you and what I am doing for you. And I want you to go over and help old Brother Derek. He's going through a tough time. You take that comfort that you got from me and go give him a heaping helping of it. Hey, what did God give us to comfort other people with? Not anything within ourselves. That's why anybody can do it. Anybody who is a saved, born again Christian, God can take you when you have been through the troubles, and when you've been through the fire, God comforts you, and that gives you something then to comfort other people with. God's comfort. Remember the morning message today? Everybody needs somebody. There are a lot of hurting people in the world. You say, well, I haven't got time to think about them. Boy, I've got troubles of my own. Well, we've all got troubles, but what kind of a world would we have if everybody just got submerged in their own troubles and didn't help anybody else? Would we ourselves get more help from God if we decided to be selfish and not to help others with the comfort that we've been comforted with? You see, this is how God uses us. Everybody needs a purpose for living. You might not be able to preach a message. You might not be able to sing a special. You might not be able to run a bus route. You might not be able to teach junior church. I don't know how anybody does that. <laughs> you might not be able to do a lot of things in the ministry, but you can comfort people if you've been in trouble, and who hasn't? If you've been in trouble and you've had hurts and heartaches, you have been comforted by God, you can take somebody else under your wing and you can help them. God can use you to do that. There's not one single saved person in this room tonight whom God cannot use 
to take that comfort that you've experienced from him. And I hope you have experienced help from him. And you can take that comfort and you can go be a blessing to somebody else. Everybody needs somebody. I guess in some sense this message is just kind of an extension of the morning message. We need people. God's the source but he uses us as channels to help other people. In Judges 14, there's a story. I, I know you'll remember. The kids have probably heard it before. And uh, the, you remember old Samson, he's going down, going down to Timnath, and he's walking along by himself, and he meets up with a lion. And he, uh, he goes to hand-to-hand combat with a real live lion. And the Bible says that God's strength came upon him and with his bare hand, Samson slew the lion. I mean, he kills that old rascal right there, out there in that old desert, arid area, Jerusalem, south of Jerusalem probably. And it is, it's desert-like out there. Oh boy, sand and rocks, and not much vegetation and a hot, arid sun beating down. And so that old lion's carcass deteriorated pretty fast. I mean, animals ate the meat off of it and the sun, uh, sun bleached the bones. And so you just have this old lion laying out there and his old rib cage is just like a little jail house there and his old, whole carcass laying there, just the bones left, all the meat's gone. The animals got it and the insects ate it and the sun bleached out the bones. You got this pretty white skeleton of a lion laying out there and guess what happened? A hive of bees, a colony of bees moved into that lion's carcass and they'll do stuff like that. I've seen bees. I've kept bees for years, and I've seen them. I've seen them move into water meters. I've seen them move into old used diesel cans, gas tanks, into walls of houses or roofs. Bees will move into anything. And so the Bible says these bees, this colony of bees, moved into that old lion's carcass and started making honey. <laughs> I guess they had a slab of honey hanging from each rib. <laughs> And old Samson then later on, after a few weeks have passed, he's on his way back down with his parents this time. And he comes by the, where he killed the lion. And he turns off the path. He remembers where he was. And he goes over there where the old lion's carcass was laying just to see if it's still there. And there's a hive of bees, man. A lion rib cage full of honey. He scoops in a bunch of that honey and, man, he's eating it. That's good stuff. I mean, can you just see Samson with the honey dripping off of his chin, maybe running down his belly, mixing with a sweat? <laughs> That'd be funny. And so he, he eats some of the honey, and, and you can't eat a lot of honey or make you sick. And so he ate all he wanted, and he went back off the path over there where his parents were, and the Bible says he brought them hands full of honey and shared with them. It kind of reminds me of this thing of being hurt and in tribulation and getting the comfort of God, we're getting the victory from God and then we're able to pass it on to other people like Samson passed on the honey from the lion's carcass. God gave him the victory that day when the lion came upon him. God gave him the victory. And so then that same victory he was able to pass on. The beautiful sweetness of the victory was passed on to his parents. You can help others. In verse number 5 of our text it says, For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation, comforting, consoling, also aboundeth by Christ. Do you know the greatest need in Liberty Baptist Church? I don't know that it's more preaching and more teaching. We got people doing that. I don't know that it's singing specials, music. Instruments, I mean, those are nice, but the Lord's gifted us with that, and we've got people doing that. I, I don't know that we need more Sunday school teachers today. I hope we do in a, in a few weeks. When things begin to pick up a little more, we want to start more Sunday school classes. But right now, I don't know that we need any, anything like that. Do you know what we do mean, need? There's a a world full of people that are hurting. And what we do need is people that can take the victory that they've got from God and find others and pass it on. Show them how to get the victory too. The comfort that only God can give. What a great position that is in the body of Christ. How people who are just ministering to others 
and finding somebody that's hurting. And I'm not talking about getting nosy and getting into everybody's business. I mean, if they decide to tell you what's going on, that's fine. But I'm just saying, recognize when somebody's hurting and be available for them. How do you know when somebody's heart's broken? Well, if you've been there, you probably can recognize it. You've had your heart broken. You can probably see it in others. You know when they're needing it. People that are hurting usually don't go to people that have never been hurt themselves. You know who they go to? They like to talk to somebody else that's gone through a similar experience. It's been said that you can't draw up water out of a dry well. And when you've been hurt and you've got the victory and the comfort of God, you're not a dry well anymore. You're filled up with the comfort of God and you can pass it on. Hebrews 4.15. I'm going to read this in just a minute. But Jesus didn't come in the flesh. You know, we just got through celebrating Christmas, the incarnation of Christ, God in the flesh. You know, Jesus didn't come in the flesh so he could feel and know to understand how we feel when we're down and out, when we're having problems. He didn't come so he could understand how we feel. You know why he came? He came so he could undergo the same things we undergo and we could understand that he knows. He knows what it's like. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus came to go through what we go through. The same type of hurts, heartaches, tribulations. Not so he could understand them better, but so you could understand that he knows what you're going through. The poet said, God has not promised us skies always blue, flower-strewn pathways all our lives through. God has not promised sun without rain, joy without sorrow, peace without pain. But God has promised strength for today, rest for the labor, light for the way, grace for the trials, help from above, unfailing sympathy, undying love. That's the God of all comfort. Would you bow with me, please? Father, we, we love you and thank you that you do understand how we feel when we're going through times of heartache and trouble and tribulation. And Lord, it seems like we're pretty good at covering up some of those hurts around our friends and fellow church members. And Lord, we I guess we've learned how to fake it. And it seems like it might be easier if we try it that way, but it only seems that way, Lord. We really need your comfort. Just smoothing it over and acting like everything's okay, putting a smile on our face when our hearts are broken may help us to get through a, an hour or two around our friends and fellow church members, but Lord, it doesn't fix the problem. They can give us sympathy, but Lord, you can give us sympathy and strength to boot. We pray that you'd help us to bring our problems to you. And Lord, that you would give us that strength. We know that you know how we feel, but we need to know your strength. Lord, I pray you'd bless the invitation time. In Jesus' name we pray. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Would you stand?